Hello there, and how is everybody today? Oh, I'm so delighted to hear it. And guess what? So are we. We are now out of quarantine. He did his regulatory two tests and both were negative. So now we are free to come and go as we please. Isn't that great news? Well, so what are we going to do then if we've got all of this freedom? Well, the last flight was down under in New Zealand. Today we're going to go up over and to Alberta, Canada, where Bob Roberts has requested a flight between Fort McMurray and Edmonton. Now, I tell you a little bit about Bob. He's retired oil man. He did this flight between Edmonton and Fort McMurray hundreds of times, he says. But he has no idea of how the pilots worked the route, how they put the route together. So he wants to go into some detail about how we put that route together as we're going to do that same route today. Now, to start out, we're going to start out at Fort McMurray and we've got some lovely freeware for that. It's really quite good. It lacks a lot of detail of the actual airport, but we'll do all right. And for arrival, well, we have some wonderful scenery from FSIM Studios and that's for Edmonton. So how are you feeling today? You feeling like a little escape? Yes. You think sure. Alberta would be a good place to go to? Yes. I but, wanted to do it. But look, look what we have here. I mean, this morning it was nine degrees when I got up to feed the birds. Now it is 19 degrees and we have some sunshine. Why would we want to leave sunny England and go to Alberta in Canada? Oh, I know a good reason. When Bob spoke to us, he said that they were having temperatures in the 30s in Alberta. So it, let's go. Is that a good reason? It's a good reason. That's a good reason. So who's going to fly today? You or me? I fly today. You fly today. But I need uh, your instruction because I feel so newbie. Oh, you're just a newbie. Okay, well, that's okay. And by the way, so is Bob. Since Bob retired, he built himself this wonderful 737 MAX and it's almost completed. Here's a picture of what it looks like looking through the cabin door. What do you think of this? Isn't this magnificent? Wow. Anyway, Bob wants to get the detail on how we make the plan so that when he does his flights, he will have a better understanding. Let's uh, have a little history lesson, if we may. Now, I'm a commercial pilot. I also have IFR rating and everything else, but not for jets, only for propeller. I only flew cargo planes. And in cargo planes, the windows are much larger. In a jet, the gap of the window is only like this because you have to fly just about everything with instruments when you're flying a jetliner today. In my aeroplane, it was smaller and I was in mostly uncontrolled airspace anyway. I would be lucky if there was a radio station to be able to call to get a kind of a fix to go there. I would navigate by looking at mountains or streams or villages and that is how I find my, found myself to go to the destination. Today is very sophisticated for an airliner. 
because they are so big they have to be very controlled especially since 9-11 happened everything is controlled whereas I could fly VFR that's visual flight rules today jets have to fly IFR instrument flight rules so even if the weather is like it is here today they still have to file an IFR flight plan. Part of that also has to do with controlled airspace. Here in England, controlled airspace starts at 6,000 feet. In America and in Canada, this is something that we'll need to remember when we program. In Canada, the controlled airspace starts at 18,000 feet. So above that, you must have an instrument flight plan in order to go into any of that airspace. Everything is very tightly controlled. Now, as I would fly, I would fly using, as I said, terrain features. Jets have to fly on specific courses. They're called air routes or jetways, and they have numbers, just like we have, you know, we go down the M1 until we get to the A64 and, and make a right at a waypoint that's called the Halfway House Pub. <laughs> that's, that's how you would do it in a car. In the air, they have jetways, which is, starts out with a letter and followed by a number. And waypoints are usually five letters. Not always an easy word to remember because they can be a mixture of letters, but they identify a waypoint. Then when you get to the destination, the air controller will want you to go onto what they call a star. A star is a standard approach. And that approach says that if you're coming from one particular area, then you must follow that route in to get to the runway that is active, whichever that runway is. And if you're coming from a different direction, there is a different star for that. Same with a departure. Now, Fort McMurray, that CYMM, it has a departure going to the south. And we'll look at that chart in just a minute. But it has only one runway and it shows two routes going south. It depends on which runway is in use as to which one of those sides that we take. And I'm going to show you how that works when we go into Navigraph. So, okay so far? Right, okay then. So we have stars, we have SIDS, and now we need to build our route. The easiest way to do that from our perspective, of course, is to look at what another airline does. And we are going to be following, what is the airline? It's WestJet. WestJet Encore 3382. WestJet 3382. That's the, that's the flight that we're going to follow. So are you ready? We'll show you how we build the flight and we'll do some more elemental steps in this one. So Bob, Pay attention now, there will be an exam. Ha! As if, right? Okay, so let's go on over and have a look at FlightAware, Windy.com, and then go into SimBrief and have a look at how to build the flight plan. Then after that, we'll go into Navigraph and assemble our own flight route directly there, okay? Here we are with WestJet Encore 3382. And here are the codes for the flight underneath. This particular one arrived at Edmonton over 14 hours ago at gate 66. We're going to have a look at that on Google Maps in just a moment. It said it left gate four. We'll show you where that is also in just a moment. And here's the route that they took. Oh, let's have a look over here. It's the scheduled departure. Taxi time was seven minutes for departure and 13 
minutes at arrival. Right, so here's the, the route that they took. Here's uh, y, uh, CYMM, that's Fort McMurray, and here is Edmonton down here. Straight, just a pretty much of a straight route. That's about what you would expect in a non-busy area. And let's have a look at what they had. Oh, they had 24,000 feet on theirs. So we'll see what uh, Simbrief gives for us. Now their aircraft type was a de Havilland Dash 8, which is uh, just a turboprop. In fact, a lot of uh, turboprops flew in and out of uh, Fort McMurray. So that would probably have been the type of aircraft that you flew on, Bob. Uh, they filed it and they actually did it. Now, here is their route right here. So see this at the bottom? This is their route. Let me explain this. The first part, this CACHO, C-A-C-H-O, is in actual fact a waypoint right about here. See that where my mouse is? The RESAX is another waypoint that is just about here. And then the Resax 1, that is the actual star for the approach into Edmonton. And we'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. So those are the uh, important things that make up the flight plan. Well, we've got that. So let's have a look at windy.com. Here we are, here's Fort McMurray. You can see the two big rivers that are along the side of it. And it says the wind is 160 degrees at two knots, fairly calm. Visibility is nine statute miles, clouds overcast at 13,000 feet, temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. And the altimeter is just a little bit above uh, standard, very little. Looking at the runways, if that is the direction, then let's have a look at the runways. Ah, here you can see there is only one runway and it's left to right. So if the wind is blowing in this general direction, so in all likelihood, we'll be taking off going down here and we can zoom in to see what the number of the runway is. Two six, according to this. What do you think? Do you think it might be two six when we actually do get the flight plan put together? Yes, if the wind not change. There you go. That's the important thing. If the wind does not change. All right, let's have a look now at windy.com for Edmonton. And here is Edmonton right there. That's the airport. This is saying the wind is 290 degrees at four knots. Not a very strong wind. Light shower, rain, mist, smoke. Clouds are overcast to at 9,600 feet and temperature is 18 degrees. But here, look at this. The dew point is also 18 degrees. Now, when you get the outside air temperature and you get the dew point at the same temperature, the likelihood is you're going to get mist, fog, something that is going to become visible and not necessarily allowing you to take off or land as a VFR rule. With VFR, you have to see where you're going. You actually have to be in control of your aeroplane and you as the pilot are responsible for keeping away from clouds, from buildings, from mountains, and more importantly, from other aircraft and from clouds. You're not allowed to fly in and out of clouds. Instrument rated pilots can fly in clouds because they are controlled by the air traffic controller who is watching everybody on their radar. So we'll have to see whether we will have VFR or IFR for landing. 
Having a look at Fort McMurray on G Maps, and here it is, this is what it looks like. This is the satellite picture. Down here, this is the new terminal building. And you can see that there are two access points here to get in and out of it. This is where the WestJet flight originated from. However, on the freeware scenery that we have, there, there are no taxiways to get on and off this area. So we're going to go from the old terminal area, which is up here at the north. So this is where we will start out up here. Now, Bob, I suspect that when you came in and left from Fort McMurray, you came in over here at the Executive Flight Center because that's where most of these smaller prop jets would come in and take off from, right in here. That's my suspicion, and you can uh, check that out and correct me or tell me later if that is true to your memory. So we are going to start out here, and then it, if it goes the way we think, we'll taxi out to here and then take off on this runway. Now, Edmonton. Here's Edmonton from the satellite. It's an L-shaped uh, airport, and the here is the terminal building pretty much in the middle of the bottom end here. Now, we saw that it arrived at uh, Stand 66. Stand 66 is right here. And I'm going to zoom in so that you can see. Can you see that? 6-6. Six, six. So they came in and parked right there. And what do you think? Do you think we might be able to do the same thing when we land? Yes, because it's a large gate. It's a large gate. And as long as it's not occupied, shall we try to get into the same space? Why not? All right. Well, you'll be piloting, so it will be up to you to navigate us in. All right, now let's go into SimBrief and see what it gives us. So airline, we are Ryanair. We are flight 186. We're going to depart from CYMM and we're going to arrive at CYEG. And CYOD is the alternate they've given us. Now we're going to put in our Ryanair configuration, which as you can see is a B737. Now SimBrief may take the route, but it also takes the aircraft and it does a lot of calculations. That airframe type has a database that SimBrief has. It knows its gross weight. It knows what the weight will be empty. It knows what it will be full. It knows what the fuel burn is going to be. It knows its performance. It knows what takeoff it's going to require. It knows all of that. So when it calculates this flight plan for us and gives us the fuel that we require, it's actually calculating all of those figures based on the profile of that airframe. So Bob, when you put yours in, your profile is going to have to be a 737 MAX. And that's a different airframe. It's got different engines and the burn rate is a lot different. In fact, the 737 MAX is a lot more economical to run and it will go a longer distance. Now, climb profile and everything is right here. The cruise profile is six because that is the uh, standard for Ryanair. Here's the registration, EI, ENI. And you can look this up. This is an actual Ryanair aircraft, 737-800. It's about 10 years old now, still operating. It's made hundreds of flights. Now, passengers, we are always full, of course, because we are Ryanair and we are always popular, aren't we? <laughs> yes, for sure. For we, our champagne. Oh, it's for all of our champagne. And that's because 
we have one ton of champagne and caviar on board. <laughs> now, here, oh, look at this. That is exactly the same route and same, same flight plan that was used by WestJet. WestJet. How about that? And it's telling us, if we look up here, the scheduled flight time is one hour and 20 minutes. We don't need any extra fuel. The route distance is 217 miles, nautical miles. And there is our route right here. There's Fort McMurray. There's Cacho. There's the Cacho Waypoint. There's Resax Waypoint. And then the rest is the approach into Edmonton itself. And over here is, this is McNair Alternate Airport that they've got for us. This is, I'm named after Group Captain R.W. McNair. And it's got all the basic information in it that we would need in case we needed to divert. All right, we're going to go up here and we're going to click on Save Flight and close. Generate this, yes. Now we're going to generate this flight plan, but we're not going to put it into Navigraph like we normally do, because we need this flight plan for Active Sky and also for our flight planning inside of P3D. So. I'm going to show you what we do in just a moment. Oh, look at this. We are flying at flight level 300. Look at that, 30,000 feet. And that's the reason for that is because we are bigger, we are faster, we are heavier, and we can climb to that altitude a lot easier. Why do jets fly at such high altitudes, you may ask? because the engines are not efficient at a lower altitude. Propeller aeroplanes fly very well at lower altitudes because propellers are using the air and the density of the air at lower altitudes. But in a jet at high altitudes where it is very thin, the air, then the jet engine comes into its own and it is very economical to fly. Airtime, 43 minutes. We'll start the clock and see whether that works out. Our block fuel is 5,759 kilograms, almost six tons of fuel. There's the routing, direct to Cacho, then direct to Resax, and then they're suggesting it'll be the Resax 1 approach. And there it is. And here's the details of the flight plan. Right here, if you can see this little part right here on the first page, this says the flight level. F300 is flight level 300. And then it has an abbreviated route following it. The DCT stands for direct. Over here, there's the average wind, we'll need to put that in. We'll need the cruise cost index. cost index right there, which is six. Here we will need the block fuel. And then we'll also need the reserves plus the trip and taxi added up to give us the trip, the total trip burn. Now, tankering. If for some reason, the cost of the fuel at Fort McMurray was but a fraction of what it would cost at Edmonton, then it may be worthwhile to fill up in Fort McMurray for both the trip there and the trip back, because it's cheaper then with the cost of the fuel. Even though you've got the cost of flying the aircraft, that's always a factor. My friend David, he flew for Fly Dubai before he flew for Ryanair. Now, Fly Dubai, in Dubai itself, the cost of fuel there is less than water. Let me say that again, in case you didn't hear that. The cost of fuel 
is less than the cost of water. So, when they were flying to India, where the cost of fuel in India is very high because of taxes and everything else, he used to fill up with fuel for the trip to India and the trip back because it was cheaper to fly to tanker the aircraft to India and come back with it rather than buy the fuel in India. And when you're thinking of cut rate airlines, they're always going to go for the cheapest option every time. Make sense? Yes. If it was your money that you had to pay, you, this is what you would do, right? I will fill even the, bot the, what the bottle of the water. The bottle of water. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Think of it this way. If you're driving a car and the cost of fuel in, say, Fort McMurray is... Uh, I think you use gallons still in North America. So if it's uh, five dollars a gallon in Fort McMurray and it is only two dollars a gallon in Edmonton, you will only have enough fuel in your car to drive to Edmonton because it's cheaper to fill up in Edmonton than it would be to carry the fuel all the way back and forth. So it's all a matter of economics. All right, going down here, here is our descent information. We'll need to put the uh, flight levels and the flight direction and speed in. And then all the way down here at the bottom, let's see if there's any weather patterns to be concerned about. No, no weather patterns. But there is a crosswind that we're going to... Oh, yeah, that's at 240. Here's our flight level. It's not oh, that's not a crosswind, is it? That's oh. a headwind. So we're going to be facing headwinds at our flight level going down. So that is possibly why they have worked out 300 for flight level for us. And it's even faster and stronger at flight level 340. Here's the profile. As you can see, this is the elevation that we'll be crossing. Top of climb, top of descent. And this is Edmonton here. And here's our start at Fort McMurray. This wavy line this is the troposphere. Now, the troposphere is important only for temperature purposes because although the temperature will drop the higher that you go, once you cross the troposphere, the temperature actually goes up a little bit. So in case you needed to fly at that altitude, it's important to know about the temperature variations because that will have an impact upon engine performance. Okay, we are now ready to go into Navigraph and build our flight plan. So you ready? Are you ready? Yes. Okay, then here we go. Here we are in Navigraph charts and we're going to click on flights, new flight, now this time, instead of doing it from SimBrief, we're going to do a manual input. So we're going to build this from scratch inside of Navigraph. So click on that, Origin Airport. You remember what our Origin Airport is, Captain? C-I-M-M. C-Y-M-M, Fort McMurray. And the destination C -Y -E -G. is... C-Y-E-G. C-Y-E-G, that is correct. And we're going to now create, but we're not going to auto-generate the route. We're just going to create this. So now we have... A direct line. A direct line. Now, I'm using the high on route charts in the background here, just to show you what, uh, what these airline routes look like. You see here, these routes here. This is the J508. Here is the J527. 
Here is the Q914. This is the J517Q. So think of it as, as a freeway in Canada or America, Autostrada in Italia, motorway here in England. That's what these are. And the waypoints are these little diamonds that you can see here. And look at this. See this? Here is Cacho. That's the first waypoint. And down here, this one right here, that's Resax. That's the second waypoint. And we're going to put those in. So, first of all, let's bring in all of the charts that we're going to need. So I'm going to right click on this, left click on open charts list. We want the airport information and we want the SIDS and we'll let's have a look at this one. This is the one that we'll be using because this one is going simply east and west. We are going to be going south so we want to have the Cacho 2 departure on our list here. Alright, going out of that, let's go to our destination, open the charts list. We want the airport and we want the positions and coordinates for coming in. We are being told that we'll be using the uh, Resax 1A star. So let's have a look at the Resax 1A. Here's the Resax 1A and if I do this, well, I'll put it at the bottom and then do an overlay. So this is the arrival. Now, jets, when they're coming in, they need to be spaced from each other. Air traffic control needs to be able to know where everybody is at and so that there is no collision. And because you have limited visible visu uh, visibility from the cockpit of a jet, you will need to follow this route all the way in. So we'll be following this as you can see, it says here, from Ribsu, another waypoint, go 176 degrees down to Ev Esvit, at which point you will be 8,000 feet or above. Then go to Movgo, where maximum speed is 210 knots. We should be slower than that because it's easier to control the aircraft. And you should be 7,000 feet or above. And even there's an option here now for Bipna. Again, maximum speed to 10 and 5,000 feet or above. We may choose the Bipna to make our approach. And I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Now, it's suggesting that we'll be coming in on runway 20. So it means that we'll be coming down here, going in this direction, and then intercepting the final approach onto runway 20. So let's go ahead and bring in runway 20. Now to do all of this, I'm going to clear all of these points and I'm going to go into type the route. Now here I'm going to go to our first point, which was C-A-C-H-O. And I need to put a space there. And then the next one was Resax. And if I save that, now the route has changed color a little bit here. See, now we have Cacho right here. And here we have from here to here, we now need to put in a, an arrival. But before we do that, let's have a look at the departures. You can see that there is this way or is that way. Going to type route and I'm going to go here. We're going to go C-A-C-H-O to departure. Save. Then it comes up with this. Now we'll be taking one of these two routes to the south. And it all depends on which runway that we're actually going to take. So if I choose runway 8, 
look what happens. That one goes blank and it shows this one to be the active. But if I choose runway 26, then it's that one. And that, in actual fact, is the one that we're going to be using as long as the wind holds steady at what it is now. Down here, when we get to our destination, we are supposed to be coming in on the, the Resax 1. And then we'll save that. And here you can see there's a lot of different routes going in. You can go in all kinds of directions on this one, but we're only going to be needing one. Well, if it holds up that we're going to be coming in on runway 20, which is from the north, then our point of contact will be here at Gabet, Angle. How do you like those for words? <laughs> and then direct in to there. So we're going to add here we're going to go runway 20 at Gabet and look at that. It now brings in our full complete run. And close this up here and look back. There it is. I'm just going to click now to world map so that you can see what this will look like going over the ground. All the way down until we get into the Edmonton airspace and we then will come in on this. Our transition, and this is the transition, this is our initial approach fix. And then that will take us straight down on a final to land at runway 20 at Gabbard. And according to this, maximum speed is 190 knots, and we have to watch out for this tower to the side so that we don't run into it. So will you keep an eye open for that? Because that will be on your side, Captain, going in. Yes. I will be with my eyes open. Eyes open. No snoozing. <laughs> okay, let's look at the charts here that we've got. Here's the ATIS is 128.0. The tower is 118.3. Final approach course is 200 degrees. The airport elevation is 2,373 feet high. Decision height is 250 feet above the landing altitude. So we'll be actually, we'll set the radio for decision height at 389. And then that will call out the minimums for us as we come in on the final. It's recommended that we approach from Gabbett at 5,000 feet to Ongol and then make the descent all the way down to the minimums, which is right here, and at which kind time we either commit to land or we decide to do a missed approach. What is the difference between barrow and radio and which number from the chart is the barrow and the radio and how I can know it? This one, the big one here, uh, is the barometer setting 2726. So if you spin that dial to barometric settings, then when the barometer says we are 2,726 feet above, that's when it will call out minimums. But the radio is a device that sends out a signal directly and measures the height of the aircraft from the ground. So it's a little bit more precise and it also is a little bit quicker to put into the programming when we get to that. Does that make sense? Yes. Because if you take the, the runway, which is 2,337, and you add 389 feet, you come up with that figure right there. 2,726 feet. Same thing. Yes? Yes. Good. 
So this is what we'll be doing. We're now ready to go into the cockpit and crank it up. So are you ready to fly? Yes, I'm ready to fly. In that case, let's go. Ah, oh, there you are, Bob. Come on in, take a seat in the jump seat, and let's go through the list to get ourselves started. And this is what you will be doing in your 737 because it's pretty much the same in the procedures. So, are you ready? And Captain Ludovic, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Surfaces and chocks have been cleared, check. check. Maintenance status is check. Good, battery on. Battery on. Do we have voltage? We have voltage. Yes. And landing gear lever is down, checked. Three green lights. And now phones are off. Off. Next, um, fuel pumps on. Fuel pumps on. APU start. APU start. Right. Now, you have something similar to this, Bob, on yours. Yours is a slightly different configuration here than we have, but you have still have an APU that you're going to need to start in order to get enough power to run everything. And um, it's like having a donkey engine uh, on one of those big Caterpillar tractors, you know, the small petrol engine that you start and then that starts the big diesel engine. So that's what the APU is in, in many respects. So you need to look for that. Of course, if you have ground power, then you can bypass all of this. But essentially, having the ability to use APU makes you independent. Ah, coming up. It's coming down. There's the EGT. It's stabilizing. Yes. And... We now have 115 volts coming off the APU. So now we can do a lot of things. So galley light is on. Galley on. Okay. IRS, nav to go to nav. Left and right. Good. Emergency exit lights on. Emergency exit lights on. No smoking. No smoking on. Fasten seat belts. On. Left and right window heat. I've got, I'm close, I can do that. And then the probes. Uh, sometimes you wait for this, but we do it in advance. And then the left and the right hydraulic pumps. We check that the forward service hatch's light is on, which means the door is open. Equipment means that the electric stairs are down. And then over here, I'm going to put on the APU bleed, because you have a panel just like this. I'm going to turn on the recirculating fans left and right. And then the left pack, the right pack, and the isolation valve is now in the open position or auto position. And now we have heat if we need heat, and cooling if we need cooling. Right, our flight level today is going to be 30,000 feet, so I'm going to put 30,000 in this. And what is going to be our landing altitude? It's uh, 2373. 2373, so that would be 2400. Uh, two so we have that set. All right, and we'll put in altitude here and then that part is done all right making sure everything is looking good across the board and the next thing that we'll do is we'll put on the steady light and then that lets the ground crews know that there is somebody in here and proceed with the FMC programming so, so go ahead and put in and go ahead and put in our starting point CYMM don't put in a gate and and we don't know what that is but we do know what the airport is and that is this one so we'll put in this into the memory see it goes down here when I push it 
and now whatever's in the memory is going to appear in here when I push that. Just like that. So now we have our location. So next we're going to put in our root. Root. Origin, C-Y-M-M. Destination, C-Y-E-G. We're Ryanair Flight 186, RYR 186. Good. And now let's go down page. And we're going now going direct to Cacho. Okay, Cacho is the first point. And then where do we go? Direct to Resax. Okay. In this case, I put it the Resax direct here. But if I have a, a jetway, where I have to put it? For example, a jetway G17. I have to put it here now. If, oh, if, I we're, have. if we're going, if we're going on a flight route, yes, you would. So this line is for the flight which, routes. Which, yes, it is. Which we not have. Which we don't today. have. That's right. So activate. Activate. And do that. Okay. Now we'll go into departure and arrivals. But before we do that, we need to. Fort McMurray Airport information. Zulu two zero zero three. Zulu wind calm. Visibility niner. Sky condition. Ceiling one two thousand. Overcast. Temperature one seven two point one three. Altimeter one zero one five. Landing and departing runway two five. VFR aircraft say direction of flight. All aircraft read back hold short instructions. Advise controller on initial contact you have. Zulu. Right, we have Zulu. And we are going to be departing on runway 25. 25. Which Actually, is it's 26 on the Navigraph because this, unfortunately, is an older scenery that we're using here. By the way, this is freeware scenery, so this uh, we don't expect an awful lot with this. So we can put the course, this is 255 for actually our runway departure. So 255 and put uh, 255 in the heading. Good, we're and good then, on that. And then put your weather button weather for and me. the terrain over here for me. So the actual departure for us is runway 25, but we have uh, 26 with the Navigraph. That's correct. And uh, we have the seats catch 2. Catch 2, correct. And execute. And put that in. If you remember what we were doing with that, that means that we'll be going out there and then down that way to get to catch rather than the other way. Oh, arrival. Yes, let's do arrival. We, and for that, it is we, presumed that we're coming in on runway... Yeah, it's presuming uh, from the same reef. Runway 30. In use 30, yes. 30, or do you think it will be 20? From same reef, we have 20, so... And we do it for... Well, we have a little bit of an issue here, Bob. Um, we have sim brief telling us that it may be 2-0 and we have the weather program telling us it's likely to be 3-0 which means we may have to do some fast changing when we get close which of course is some of the detail that you were looking for. Alright, let's put in 3-0 that matches the active sky. So, no, ILS 2, 12 ILS three and zero. Okay. Press x and then we have uh, Jevon or Lopti. You can utilize Lopti. Lopti. It's better because we arrive from that direction. Yes, we do. And so execute that. And now we can go to fix. And put in our fix, which is C-Y-E-G. C-Y-E-G. And we need 4 mile. Slash 10. Slash 30. Now why, we go, why we need all this? Well, the 30, it makes a circle around our destination. We've got three circles. The 30 mile circle 
happens to be the limit of what we can actually contact the tower using P3D. So if we were outside of 30 miles, we couldn't contact the tower, but if we're 30 miles, we can then contact the tower for landing instructions. The 10 mile limit, we need to be definitely set up for our approach at 10 miles. So we need to have our speed down, we need to have flaps 10, we need to be all ready to go into full landing mode at that point. And the four mile limit, that's the point that where Ryanair wants its pilots to actually put down the gear. So that's uh, when the gear goes down, the full flaps go down and we're in full landing mode and four miles later we're actually touching the ground. So if you will go now to descent and go to forecast and put in the information for 200, 150 and 100. And then what's the Q&H at our destination? It's on the screen. 1016. 1016. So what are our figures then for the three levels? 257 slash 16. 281 slash 22. And Two seven six slash sixteen. That's it. And then execute. Now if we hadn't got a flight plan that gave us all these pages and pages of data and no tams and everything else, we wouldn't have that. So let's go into legs and let's go in and look at the plan. Now I'm going to use my phone on this. This is what happens when he pushes the buttons. You'll notice that the screen alters. See, it goes to the next waypoint, the next waypoint, and the one after that, one after that. See, and there's the 30 mile circle and the 10 mile circle. And then it comes in, and then it follows it around all the way into that. So we have here a problem, I see it, because it's vectorized after Lotti and uh, we have the depth, which is uh, not including on our pen, because from Lotti we have to go to Gvox. What's the name? Precisely, Gvon. So Why do we need to go to Gvon? Because it's uh, our end is that one. Yeah, but we have to go to lobby first to get to G1. Yeah, but we have the depth on, but we don't, which we, we want to eliminate. We want to eliminate that. And for this reason, I take Lotti, which is that one here, and put it no, on the Lotti on, here. On that one there. That's it. And then execute. execute. And now we see the change. Now go, go through each of the steps again. What we're looking for is a clear line bringing us all the way in, and, and we, we have. have it. Okay, you see how that works? Now then, next thing that we need to do, where are we at, is we need to put in the initialization. So let's go to root. Okay, you're at it. Now, our Plant fuel is the is, reserve and the trip together. It comes to what? It equals 5,016. Yes. Which then makes it five for the program in there. So let's put five tons. And the reserves are the reserve is 2,651. So 2,2.7. And cost index, it, oh, double click on the zero fuel weight. That allows the computer, onboard computer, to do all the calculations. Cost index is six. 
cruise altitude is 300. Cruise wind, which is the average wind that we find on the sim brief. Uh, on the sim brief charts, yes. It's 239 slash 20. And where our transition altitude, since we're in the North Americas, is flight number 180. 180. And then execute that. N1 limit. The temperature is plus 24. So put, put 24 and put it up on the top. Good. And then take off. Flaps. Uh, our runway is not an awfully long runway, it's 7,000 feet, so we'll go flaps 10. And we're at a higher elevation here. Now, that's something else that you need to consider, Bob, is that at a higher elevation, the air is thinner. And when it's hot outside, and right now we're recording 24 degrees, the air is even more thinner, so the density altitude is thinner. We have 60 tons of aircraft to lift off and we're going to need every inch of runway that we can. So do we use flaps 5, which means we'll need longer takeoff, or do we use flaps 10, which requires a shorter takeoff? The safety factor says we should use flaps 10. So we use flaps 10 and then double click on the center of gravity and then that brings up the trim that we need to put in our trim wheel. And if we need to alter it, that's where the up nose and down nose on the yoke comes in. And then single click on each of those. So what is a V2? It's 144. 144 in there. All right, now, if you'll put that on first, always put this on first because that's the active flight director. This is the secondary flight director. Then we push that to see that we get a green light and that and we get a green light. That means our flight plan has been accepted and there are no errors. Push that up and we'll leave out. Do we have a VOR? Yes, we do. Yeah. So we'll push that up. What is our VOR setting for uh, What's the localizer frequency for runway 30? Check it out. It's 109.1. So 109.1. And we have it, Justin. It is in. And what is our frequency for ATIS? It's 128.0. All right, we have that in standby. Okay, now put on the yaw damper. Your damper is on. Well, we're looking good. We have everything set. We are now ready to ask for taxi permission to the active and then we'll get a pushback. Now, which way are we going to push back? If we're going to be leaving from runway 25, where do we want our nose to point? To the right. To the right. So we always point our nose to the active runway. Yes? Yes. Good. So let's go ahead and contact the tower. Five. So that is five going south, yes? Yes. Ground, Ryanair 186, request taxi for departure to the south with Bravo. Ryanair 186, taxi to and hold short of runway 25 using taxiway Alpha. Contact tower on 118.1 when ready. Taxi, hold short, runway 25 via taxiway Alpha, Ryanair 186. Alpha is the runway. Okay, well. If you want to exit on D and then. But we can do it with G. We can, we can do it on G, yes. Because we are Ryanair. We are Ryanair. <laughs> there is actually an interesting restriction at this airport. The uh, taxiway G is for aircraft of a limited wingspan. But this is a freeware, and I think the taxiway is going to be more than enough for us. So we're going to cheat and take the taxiway G. That is G, isn't it? Yes. We're going to take taxiway G 
to get to the active rather than go down the middle of the runway. So that's one of the things that they put on the plates about the restriction for wingspan. Okay, now let's go into uh, menu, PDM, uh, FS actions, uh, pushback. We need to turn our nose to the right and 90 degrees and put 90 degrees in there and select the tug. Okay, now last thing, check around. Let's make sure that the door is closed. We need to tell the attendants, make sure everything is secure. Equipment is up, doors are closed crew is alerted that we're about to move. All right, push the start. Go ahead. Go ahead. We've been cleared for pushback and start. They want the tail to our left. President, ready to push. Tail to the left. Parking brake's off. Parking brake is off. Brake's released. Here we go. Okay, cleared for taxi. We need five, six, uh, five, six, and seven. One, two, oh no. Five, six, and seven. That's cleared for taxi. For pushback clearance. This is from Ryanair itself. So we can have I, five, six, and seven on. Can I turn the. Yes, start the engine. So we'll turn off. The air conditioning, otherwise there'll not be enough. I wait to 24. Wh which engine are we starting first? The engine number then two. Then we need to switch this to engine number two so that we can see the voltage when it comes through. And we when this gets to 24, then we put it up. Okay. We can hear the engine spinning. Start valve has opened. The engines are spinning up. The low pressure light has gone off, which means we're good on that. And get ready for the parking brake. Wait. 47, 49, 50. 50, do that. Switch to engine number one. Parking brake is on. Brake set. Start valve light has opened. And we are coming up on 24. Right, steering pin is disconnected. Watch for the slip release from that side. 24, the check. Deploy. Engine gas temperature is now building up. Climbing very nicely. We're getting a good start there. It's had We've got an ignition. The low oil pressure light has just gone off. We have ignition. And engine number two has 115 volts. Engine number one. Engine number one has 115 volts. We have power. Okay, now switch engine we're going to switch the bus now to engine number one and two and now i'm going to switch off the apu bleed and turn off the apu now we're putting on the packs so that the air conditioning can run again into the gal into the cabin and we are set to make our move okay i need to go to flap stand so hold on Verify takeoff speeds. Do we need to make any changes? One. One. Okay. So we are set on that. Let's make sure that we have flaps, green light, landing gear down, flaps 10, RTO set. Just a second. Probe heat is on, anti-ice is on, pumps is on, air conditioning on, but 
isolation valve is on start switches continuous APU is off recall is checked flight controls checked stabilizers BIM stop levers idle detent good is checked we're now cleared to taxi especially for you Bob so that you'd be able to see everything outside you can see on this particular scenery the taxiway is much wider than the real one so we have no qualms about taking this taxiway recommend you put 20 miles on your uh, uh, dial for the distance. tight and there's the runway straight ahead of us starting the clock
that's in the Ryanair checklist. It says that gear up, turn off five, six and seven taxi lights, turn off one and two retracted lights. So we've got those off. Crew to work. Crew goes to work at 3,000 feet. I like telling the crew to go to work. What about you? <laughs> yes. Dressed up. And coming up on flaps one, flaps one. Looking good and coming up. Okay, flaps are now up. We're making our turn. Right engine bleeds are on. Backs auto check. Landing gear up, no lights. Flaps up, no lights. Altimeter set both check. All right, we need to now turn this and match our course going down to 180. And what's our landing uh, direction? 255. 
take your seat again. We've had some interesting changes while you've been supping your champagne. We found out that the runway, the active runway, changed from 2-0 to 3-0. So we had to go into the departure and arrival, change the active runway for uh, the approach charts and everything to match the new approach. Now we got this from ATIS. We will be at the 30 mile point in a moment and then we'll be requesting our clearance for landing and we'll get the final instructions at that point. That's all right. We knew that there would be a problem with the weather. Now, Bob, let me explain to you why we are doing what we're doing. We, would, we are violating ATC control here. P3D has a slight issue with the arrivals. No matter what you have in, no matter how beautiful a flight plan you have and that you've installed, P3D will always take over and vector you left and right over your route and it makes absolutely no difference. Uh, we've tried it on different airports and everything else and that's what it does every time. So what I usually have been doing is doing an IFR departure, which is always good, but then switching it off and going on to a VFR arrival. So we don't have clearance to land, but we're going to follow it as though we do. And we're going to make our approach using the star that we have and the approach plate that we have. And you'll see that on the screen at the bottom here. Meanwhile, we are in 10,000 feet, so I turn on the fifth uh, good. Runway, landing and the runway turn. All right, good. We're set on that. Bands, and then you put it on continuous to our engines. Good. We have auto brake set for number three, and our engines are spooling back. We're on doing well. We need to be on flaps now. We need to start the flaps. You'll need to have the drag required. Yeah, we need to slow up quite a bit. We need to be at those speeds that we've set. Going to flaps two. Tower orbit eight nine up seven nine up runway three zero ready for takeoff IFR two map care flights regional. Orbit eight nine up seven nine up cleared for takeoff runway three zero. Cleared for takeoff runway three zero. When we get to Jevon, then that's when we'll go to flaps ten. And we're still on course. Good. That's right. And what did it give us for uh, Q&H? 1016. That's what ATIS gave us. Even on the airport. Drag required. You look at the screen up above. Well, it's too late now. You are. We'll just have to listen in to the tower. holding good we've slowed ourselves up we want to be at a 
decent speed when going through cloud. Cloud tends to be very bumpy if you're going very fast. So by slowing things up, we uh, save on the uh, China, you know? We don't want to break the glasses. <laughs>
see nothing. We're on final. This is why you have to learn to trust your instruments when you're an instrument pilot. Did it change to 301? Yeah, because it's 300. I know. Okay, but often this will change because Tower, this is telling you. Ready to go. Runway 30 IFR to show me. And we're watching the diamond coming down. Line and we're looking for 
a 6 6. six that's 73. 74. 72. Uh, 72. 70. And what's this one? 78. 68. 60. And that is 68, 68 huh? alpha. 66, this one. Or if you want, you can do the next one, but 66 is the one they came at. And we go up to 66. Okay. Here I can sell it a bit. Those elements are on the way. Shut down our main engines. Okay. And we're opening the doors and lowering the stairs. Well, this is the indication of what you call visible precipitation. Fog. <laughs> we knew it could be possible and it certainly turned out that way. Okay, begin all the shutdown procedures. All right. Lights are off, lights are off. Okay, off, off. Switch off the IRS and this and galley and the your damper turn off the ATIS switch off the barometer everything is cleared and ready okay and now shut off the APU fuel pumps off and battery off shutdown is complete well, Bob, that is what you call a very difficult landing. In reality, we should have gone around and gone to our alternate. I didn't see the runway at all. I couldn't even see the Vasi lights. And I'm assured, of course, that the Vasi lights are there. Um, but when you see the temperature is the same as the dew point, you know you're going to have some fog issues. And we did, big time. Did you see any lights at all going no, in? No, I see nothing. Not one light? Not even one light. But you still chose to land. <laughs> I chose to land. Maybe I crashed some glasses. Yeah, we landed on the grass. We're not exactly supposed to land on grass, but no, well. The thing of it is, is that we made it and we're here, we're on the deck and we are, the classic landing is one that you can always walk away from. That's a good landing and this is a good landing. Right Bob, we've done quite a bit today. We've done the switches for the final approach, had to make all of those adjustments. So that's what your charts do and that's what the FMS does in programming everything. And you can also see it's very busy on takeoff and very busy on landing. 
there's not much room for any kind of chit chat when you're on the landing and particularly because there's so much going on and that's the way it is in real life uh, cockpits when airliners are coming in they have an instruction no non-essential chatter at all none not from even anybody sitting in the jump seat so i hope that this answers a lot of your questions if you don't you know how to contact me just contact me and we'll clarify whatever you need and for the rest of you i hope that you enjoyed the flight what about you captain you did yes, very well i enjoyed the flight <laughs> what about it do you think he did all right yes cheers there yes you did all right so i think you did all right too so we will see you the next time on ryanair 186 bye everybody